All right, Gavin Rathbun joining Tour Life for the first time. Thank you so much, man. Looking forward to this. On a lot of hype, a lot of hype coming into this interview. A lot of people, a lot of listeners, really excited to to hear you on here. So, uh, first off, congratulations on the beginning of this season. Some really, really solid finishes there. I appreciate you. Um, oh, my bad. You guys can Where see. Where are you currently at right now? Looks there. like uh, looks like an RV situation. Uh, yeah, I'm in my RV at a pilot just outside hot springs arkansas just got done driving like 15 minutes ago i was gonna say not not too much stuff in between uh in between texas and jonesboro i'm guessing yeah no not too much you got some buckies though oh yeah you got some buckies. buckies we're out of buckies land now i believe okay yeah, now you're into no man's land until you get to Jonesboro. So <laughs> pretty much. Um, are you getting to the course early to practice? Or are you just going to play out there, uh, kind of in the off week? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Destiny will be working. So okay, nice. Um, all right. Well, before we jump into it, I kind of want to just you know one one thing with disc golf right now is there's just not that much media around it and so if you haven't been on a bunch of lead cards if you haven't been on a bunch of podcasts before it's sometimes you know people are kind of like oh yeah i know that guy he plays disc golf but they don't really know that much of your story and you're one of the people that i don't actually know all that much about your story with how you came about into disc golf so care to share that a little bit with us and the, the listeners as well yeah absolutely so I wrestled, played baseball, and played football my whole life. I was super into wrestling. It was like my full-time gig. I did it almost 365 days a year, all the way up until uh, sophomore year of high school. And uh, not everyone will know Ian Burchett, but I know you two boys know Ian. He got into disc golf a few months before I ever did. And I hated it. I hated the idea of disc golf. Like it just was not for me. I, I loved wrestling. It was what I did. And first day of my sophomore year, it was a open match, just like light practicing. And we were fooling around and I just went down nasty on my left arm and I dislocated my shoulder and hurt my collarbone pretty bad. And the doctor was like, yo, you're probably never going to wrestle quite to your full extent again. And I went out to the disc golf course there like a couple months after, after my shoulder, left shoulder started feeling a little better. I gave, I gave it a couple flicks, you know, it was just absolutely terrible, but we had an awesome community in Oswego, Illinois, where I grew up and they saw potential in me and Ian. They bought us our PDGA memberships in 2013. This was the very beginning of 2013. And it's kind of, I got right into the junior and amateur scene. So, my first year I went to junior worlds. I qualified for the final nine there. I met a bunch of really cool people. Like, uh, my first 16 and under juniors event, I played almost every round with Adam. Oh, so that's nice. how I originally met him. And just a bunch of the kids that are out there today, like the Hebenheimers and Randon Lada. Like I played with all those guys back in the day when I was getting started. What, uh, what made you kind of jump to the pro scene? What was the, like, were you starting to play locally and playing against guys that were playing on the pro scene and being like, I can do that. Kind of, it was never really my goal to become like a professional disc golfer that traveled around the country. I just didn't think there was, I guess, money in that or like a real career choice. I was pretty clueless and I went, in 2016 to amateur nationals at the toboggan course and i won that in a three-way playoff between isaac and uh i think it was adam oh wow and after that it was like i knew i could do it but i just never really trusted myself to do it and then i have a couple more buddies like alex russell noam meitzma they really were like, dude, just give it a try. Like, you can come travel with us. I hopped in a car with uh, my buddy Cameron for a year. And, like, they kind of just showed me the ropes. We were staying at a bunch of just people's houses, which I thought was crazy because I didn't grow up with, like, just letting strangers into our house or anything. <laughs> so I thought it was, like, this bizarre thing. And it was it was fun. It was just different for me. Like, I never pictured my life going that way. So when I 
finally figured out that I could do it, I knew that it was like something that I was going to push for and really, really try to do my absolute best at. So your journey, I would say, has been a little bit different than most of the people that we've had on the podcast of where, like you mentioned, you kind of, you know, jumped onto the scene winning USAM. Anyone that win USAM, everyone kind of speculates, oh, he's going to be the next big thing. You end up having a pretty good uh, couple finishes here and there at pro events, beating a lot of really good players. And you kind of start building this hype around your name. And then you end up getting injured. We don't see you for a while. You try to come back, have some kind of poor finishes. Uh, the beginning of the season, if I'm correct, you like kind of post out like saying like, I don't think I'm playing on tour yeah. anymore. And then all of a sudden you go six at chess.com 15th at the open open at Austin and six at Texas States in the deepest fields that the disc golf pro tour has ever seen. Like how talk about that journey of like kind of climbing, 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 and then all of a sudden having to go down and climb yourself back out. Yeah. Um, well, truly, I've always believed in myself and my game. I think that I have something special when it comes to throwing the disc. Even with people that I play with on the pro tour, I just feel like I, I'm I'm one of the best throwers of the disc. And um, the injury really was a huge setback. I feel like I was finally starting to Can you elaborate on the inju injury a little bit and what happened? Yeah, um, so early in the 2021 season, I think it was during the off season, something in my shoulder just felt wrong and like putting weight over my head felt way more difficult than before. No pain, really. It was just like a, I lost some mobility in my shoulder and I could felt it every week. It was like getting just a little bit worse throughout the season. And my insurance was only in Illinois. So I was kind of, oh, you know, fighting it off to try to get back to Illinois and see what really happened. And at their 2021 Ledstone, I went to the doctor and, uh, yeah, he pretty much told me I should stop playing and figure something out. My labrum was torn pretty bad. Oof. And everything else was good, which was awesome. And that was the year that the first uh, match play championship was. And uh, I don't know. I was in top 16 in points, and I just wanted to play it so, so bad. It felt like um, it was felt like something that I had really earned. So I talked with my doctor and my physical therapist, and I was like, this is three months away. Can I be in, you know, competition shape by then? And they thought I could. So I did physical therapy. I stayed off the tour for those three ish months. I felt strong and I got to um, the disc golf pro tour match play and I was throwing a practice round by myself, you know, kind of didn't have, I flew in, I Ubered to the course. I was just excited to go and play. And it was like the third hole of practice. I heard like marbles clank together and I knew that I did something. And so it went from like maybe doing stem cells to a PRP shot to you're going to have to have surgery and there's not really anything we're going to be able to do about it. So where are you at right now with the rehab and everything? Are you fully feel good to go? You're able to throw full power forehands, everything? For sure. Um, I think it's been well over a year i'd say the first year after surgery was really tough just like trying to get used to not having that mobility anymore and since then i think i've been as close to as 100 percent as i can possibly get i mean obviously there's always getting stronger and getting those smaller muscles stronger but as for like throwing a disc yeah there's no there's nothing i really can't do and i think so it's been like that for like 16 months or something just about so can you expand a little bit on your post that you made earlier where you basically tell told people that you weren't going to be a sponsored player anymore on tour like how did that come about was you know who were you previously sponsored with were they trying to resign like just whatever you're comfortable talking about yeah what's was, going on crazy there off season honestly um 
So I knew the last two years were tough. I've played worse disc golf than I ever have before for pretty much two years straight, minus like one D-Glow event and maybe OTB. I might have snuck out a top 10. It might have been like 11th or something. But, uh, oh, man. So this off season, I was very worried about, you know, getting a contract. Your and, contract was up at, at the end of last year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And that, that was, was a, with that was with um, dynamic dynamic, dynamic disc. Disc, yeah. okay. And so I was nervous about it. I mean, Destiny's on the road with me. Our two cats are on the road with us. I'm 26 years old. I know it's still young, but like, I want to be able to to support my loved ones and feel like I'm doing this for a reason, I guess. And so Dynamic offered me a contract and. It just wasn't very good. I mean, it's a lot more than what I'm getting right now, obviously. But um, I don't know. It just didn't feel worth it to – I felt like I could take a year off and, like, work on myself and get better at the things that I need to get better at. And so that whole thing didn't work out. I got a couple small sponsorship offers from other companies, the smaller companies. And nothing just seemed to be aligning with what my goals truly were. And so was, I was dynamic take the year asking off. for a multi-year? Did they want you to sign like a like? No, a... it was just a one year. Okay, one year. Okay. Um. And so we go through all that. I decide, you know what? I'm taking the year off. Like, talk to my mom about it. Talk to D about it. And you mean year off of like I'm not playing i'm not playing this year yeah like i would still play disc golf i would practice every day locally and and stuff yeah yeah get better but i wasn't going to play on the pro tour at all and i don't know if it was like it was for sure less than a week after that that destiny got a call and she got promoted to a full-time position with the tour so that obviously involves like um it makes traveling a lot easier Mm. for us and it makes it a more feasible thing because she has a full-time job on the road and it kind of gave me like the the kickstart like dude you have another chance take advantage of it and don't do anything that you will regret i guess so i've really 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 been focusing and honing in my game as much as i possibly can and i think it all starts with just being happy it's been a tough thing the past couple of years. We've dealt with way too much for how young we are. And it just feels good to not be going through that anymore. When it comes to the sponsorship, are you reaching out to these companies or are you just kind of sitting like when you basically said, like, I'm not going with dynamic anymore. Yeah. Are you reaching out to the other big manufacturers? Or are you hoping someone reaches out to you? How, how did that go about? Um, I did reach out to a couple. They said their spots were filled, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, the old mumbo jumbo. And I, I mean, I've gotten sponsorship offers since the season started. I was going to say, how has that, how has that changed now after your, your great start? Have you gotten any, anyone to, you know, answer the call? For sure. Like, um, actually just came out. I have a tour series warlock with gateway. Okay. But that's nice. a collaboration. We aren't, I'm not sponsored. I don't plan on taking any manufacturer sponsors this season. I really like where my bag's at. Mm. I like where my game's at. I'm happy and I'm able to do it. So might as well take the year to truly perform the best I can. Yeah. It's kind of like one of those situations where you're betting on yourself of where you're like, you're like, I could probably take like an okay sponsorship right now, but if I believe in myself, I can go out and have a great season and then I can really capitalize on it. Yuli, what were you going to say? Are you surprised with how well you're playing right now? Or is it, are you just like, Oh no, this is just business as usual. Or, or was your off season so good with your practice that, you know, you stepped up at chess.com and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to play, I'm going to play great this season. I can't lie. I didn't really practice that much this off season until <laughs> destiny found out she was getting a full-time job. Um, 
I was practicing, but I feel felt like I was practicing without much intention. I wasn't. I don't right. know. This off season, yeah. it was like a pretty low point, and just thinking my disc golf career had a small chance of being over with. So, so are are you surprised with how well you're playing, or is oh, it just, yeah. or are you just like, uh, this is who I, I am, this is what I do? Surprised this weekend. Okay. Um, <laughs> I putted incredibly well this week, like for sure my best putting performance of my life. That's where I struggle the most at. I'm usually just parking holes, and I'll have a ton of park shots and hit a bunch of fairways, and it was like completely twisted around this week which is probably a good thing maybe if i can figure <laughs> yeah. out both those things at the same time something special can happen yeah it was uh, uh, uh your putting was really good i did want to ask something about that did you feel the cameras showing up to your card because you played that final round really really well and i happened to just say like was it a coincidence that you end up i think you threw two, I think one in the cage, one off the band, I believe, both for birdie when the camera showed up. Yeah, both my circle one misses for the weekend. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, it, it might have affected me a little bit just because I was like, I was questioning more so why the cameras were showing up. Mm -hmm. I didn't even put together that I had birdied like six of the first seven or whatever. Yep, six of the first seven. And, um, I just knew that like AB and Gannon were and Ezra were all like way up there. So I've, I don't know. Yeah. I, I definitely thought about the camera coming when I shouldn't have, which hasn't been the case. The other few times I've been on camera this year, I thought nothing about it and just let it, but yeah, it did. <laughs> it did cross my mind this time. That's hey, what, was it, 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 go ahead. Yuli. That's one of my questions is like, uh, we were at the Airbnb and we were watching some old footage and one of them was the 2015, <laughs> Uh, amateur world <laughs> championships and it was uh anthony isaac mcdonald local guy here i just i'm spacing on his mark, name Huther. mark yet yeah, mark Huther, mm -hmm. and yourself on that card and oh my gosh watching ab he was so young it was hilarious with how how young he was but does that give you motivation like knowing that you're you came up with these guys right you told you you were talking about adam um going into a playoff mm -hmm. with him and seeing them have all that success is that something that like motivates you to where you can you're, you're watching them you guys all came up at about the same skill level and uh now they're having these great, you know, finishes and stuff. They've all won multiple times on the tour. Is that something that you can look at yourself and be like, man, I'm one of those guys. I mean, it's for sure motivating. Um, it's, it's just awesome to see that these kids that I became friends with so long ago, having so much success. And it's like, it kind of proves that that junior level was the next step. A lot of people were saying that back then, like, you guys are going to be the disc golfers of the future. And it was like something to, I couldn't really see at that time. So yeah, I have so much respect for both Adam, AB and all those guys that have continued to grind this game and it's, it's showing now. And then I wanted to ask you, he was so little, <laughs> like, what was that like playing with him back then? Like, those, I, I some could... of those videos are wild when you have like a 45 year old man yeah. playing with like a 13 year old kid. You're just like, what is, what is this sport? Time? I was, I might've been 16 in that video. Okay. So, so you were really 2015, young too. 2015, yeah. But that's still bizarre <laughs> playing against a 13 year old, right? Oh, for oh, there's sure. A massive I mean, I difference. Been, massive difference. I've been playing difference. with uh, Isaac McDonald my whole life. We're from the right, same right. area. Actually, my first tournament I ever went to was at my home course and I was in second place in rack. And uh, I got up to my hole that I was going. It's like one of the hardest holes at our local course. And I get there and it's, uh, it's little Isaac and his dad. And I'm like, Oh, cool, dude. Like I didn't think Isaac was the one playing cause he was so small. Like seriously, he was up to my hip and I was like, Oh, you shot really well. And I was talking to his dad and he's like, Oh no, I'm not playing. It's, it's him. He, and he was beating me by like four strokes or something. And I was like, what the heck? And then he gets up there flicks his blizzard boss and his, He's wearing basketball shorts, but they're like pants size. Like yeah. they're hanging over his shoes and stuff. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what is going on? 
Oh man. Yeah, it's but, it is a wild thing. Go back and watch some of those old am if you guys haven't yet. Yeah. Go back on YouTube, watch some of those old am things cuz you get to see it seriously, you get to see like 50 year old guys playing with like kids that haven't <laughs> gone through puberty. Yeah. And it's just yeah. a wild a wild c- a contrast between the two. Um we had our stats guy run some stats real quick for you, Gavin. You actually led the tournament and made circle 2 putts. And you also were seventh in total feet putting for the tournament. So, not bad. I, not I guess bad. just I'll keep that, dude. just keep making circle two putts, and uh, you'll find your way up the leaderboard. Oh, it um, helps a lot. And you know what else helps is when you miss like a couple of those circle ones in a round, your confidence is almost like shot. Oh, it's like bad. It's way harder to continue. I making missed them. nine in the first round, Gavin. Oh, it. it must I think I missed impossible. more putts in the first round. Ra- I missed more circle one putts in the first round than you probably missed putts total this past week. Yeah, yeah, it's it's impossible <laughs> yeah, to get through. Yeah, yeah, that's accurate. It's like it's, it's so accurate. hard. No, you're right. Like especially, I mean, I've played a couple rounds with you, and you know when you're throwing and then making the putts afterwards, it it takes so much less pressure off that next throw of where sure, if you miss a 25 footer, you're like, all right, I guess the next throw I have to throw it to 15 feet. And it just puts <laughs> yeah. more and more pressure on you. Well, sure, and, so. and for somebody like Gavin who throws a disc so well, you have a lot of, you have a lot of birdie putts in the circle. Yes. And so it's not like you're having like two, three, every nine, four, five, every nine, like, constantly putting it in the circle that's why you see some of the stats from the best players in the world and they they miss like two three putts and they still shoot 10 under and you're like well well imagine if they would have made that well you know they're having there are way more chances circle circles edge putts around like how many of those are you actually going to make like what's realistic type thing yeah you just gotta give yourself some chances yeah um all right before we let you go though gavin i do want you to retell a story because this was one of the first i think probably like interactions that we had off of like actually playing in a round i can't even remember what tournament was i had just thrown i was warming up and i had just thrown one of my discs in like this tall grass that i was trying to find and you like come out around the tall grass and you're like completely mangled and I'm like asking you like what's going on and you're like questioning whether or not you're playing because of a cat attack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That happened. Do you, do you want to explain what, what yeah, went yeah. down there? I'll start it off with this. <laughs> oh, Come here, boy. oh, do you have the kid that you have the perpetrator? It's this guy. <laughs> he oh, no. messed me up. And believe it or not, this is the super nice one. Like, we have we have a really mean cat that hates everybody besides me and destiny he loves us he adores us he's our little baby but this one he's so nice and just like never claws or bites at people and i was walking him in new world like on a leash being a good dad like destiny's at her cousin's (laughs) house her aunt's house i'm sending her pictures and i'm just all excited i'm like look at me being all look at me i'm taking the cat for a walk and it turned into a nightmare quick, man. Um, I was probably 500 feet away from our van. And uh, I noticed a New World, there were some people living there that probably shouldn't have been living there. They were kind of, um, I don't know. I don't, I'm, don't, don't, I don't like judging people, but they probably weren't the best people overall. You can call them hooligans. That's a good name. Yeah, yeah they were a little hooligan. Um <laughs> And they had like four dogs off a leash and I see this big one, like look over ears go up and I'm instantly like, Oh no, man. And so I take Quincy, pick him up. I start fast walking to the van. Cause if I run, I don't want to like him to get scared. I don't want the dog to start running. Dog starts running. He gets to me like a hundred feet before the van. And I'm like holding Quincy up and he's getting nervous. He's not scratching me or anything, but he's like, I can tell, I feel his claws. I'm like, okay, let's just go. This dog like starts jumping up on me and then he bites Quincy's butt. Like he full on gets a hold of Quincy's butt, like way up on me. Like it, it happened very fast and Quincy freaked out. And so I'm trying to hold him above my head, like 
and he's just mangling my arm, like biting oh. as hard as he can and not letting go. Like I can literally feel his claws moving around oh. inside my arm. It was, the situation got much worse. There was a bunch of arguing that was going on while no one was caring about this dog and cat biting my arm because the dog got me a couple of times too. It was just a bloody mess while these people were all arguing like, oh, you can't touch my dog because people were like, get your dog. Otherwise, we're going to have to do something about it. And he was more worried about that than actually getting a dog. So it happened. It felt like an hour to me, but it was only like five minutes. And the worst part about it is like I could still throw with all the bites and scratches on my arm, but they got me like right in the middle of my thumb and it just swelled up and it I couldn't move it at all. And that's oh. what got me. <laughs> I remember you saying something like I was because we were like 100 feet or 200 feet away from each mm -hmm. other or something kind of passing by and you're like yeah like a, I got attacked by a cat or something and I was like thinking like a bobcat like, <laughs> like I'm trying, I was like trying to think like mountain lion yeah like something like what I just, I, 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 should, should I be nervous out here like what is going on and then you explain it to me and I was like oh my that is like the worst luck ever the worst luck. It was just oh. continuing the pattern of bad luck that I was on, man. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. All right, well, let's uh, let's we're we're gonna kind of you know change lanes a little bit, and clearly that is a pet peeve of probably people having their dogs off leash that shouldn't have their dogs off leash. But this is a segment that is a fan favorite segment where we ask our guests what their biggest pet peeves are of in disc golf that and that could be things that you don't like people telling you that can be uh, certain things of how people play. That can be fan interactions. That can literally be anything, something that really gets under your skin uh, in, in the current landscape of disc golf. All right. I'm not sure how you boys are going to feel about this. But <laughs> I don't like that the players, I understand that the disc golf pro tour can work on a lot of things and, Overall, there are problems. I hate how much I hear, not only like on the course during my rounds, but like on the Facebook page and just, I don't like players complaining. I feel like we're all so fortunate to be able to do this. And like, especially at this time in the game, I just, I don't know. It's, it's been getting to me lately. I see all the hard work that the disc golf pro tour employees are putting in and it's hard to make things perfect, especially when the sport is growing like it is and players are expecting certain things, which I, I see all the players points as well, but I just wish that there could be a better way to communicate. No, that's and, a good one. I, I, I think, I think there's definitely levels to it. Like we, we don't shy away from saying our complaints about the disc golf pro tour or the PDGA or really anything in disc golf on here, but we try to do it, I guess, in a certain point of where it's like, it's like the big issues. Like these are things that should be top of mind and you sure. know, t like T pads, like that should be some huge. That like, one makes sense. But I agree. And you know, the Facebook page, I wish we could screenshot and show some of these <laughs> posts that are in this Facebook page. <laughs> Unfortunately it is, it is, we have to keep it behind the Facebook page, but uh, yeah, you know, it's, there's, you know, people taking a photo and there's like a root and they're circling the root being like, I tripped on this route. This is unbelievable. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. bro, we're playing in the woods, brother. Like there's gonna, yeah. there's going to be, there's going to be roots everywhere. So I agree with you to, uh, uh, to a point of where For sure. there can't, there can be a lot of negativity and, and we are very negative on a lot of things here, but I think we, maybe the difference is the Facebook group. It does seem like it's almost always negative where yeah, I think it's mostly the Facebook group that I'm talking about. And I just hate hearing it during my rounds. Like somebody throws a bad shot and then they're like, Oh, but this and this, they should do better. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know. It just gets to me a little bit. I just talk about pace of play. That's the only thing I talk about during the rounds. Cause I'm con okay, constantly, yeah. <laughs> I'm constantly trying to get people to understand that, at the end of the day, disc golf is a product. Like we are an entertainment product. You shouldn't be like selfish and thinking about it's on you. If disc golf is not entertaining, 
less and less players can play it professionally. That's just, <laughs> that's just the nature of the beast. And mm -hmm. us playing three and a half, four hour rounds is just not a good time slot for us. We need to be trying to figure out how can we get these rounds done in an hour and a half, two hours, not super long. Cause I hear that all the time being like, well, I don't want to walk faster and like mess up my, it's like, bro, at a certain point, like we need to like suck it up and figure out how to play quicker. We just, you can't play slow. You always can't oh, I, have a, I have a question for you guys. What do you think about the, the, the field size? Do you think it should be bigger or smaller? Bigger. Of course. Okay. Bigger. Especially if we're, espe yeah, I mean, I think right now looking at it, I don't like the idea of, I love with where the payouts are, where we're having the winners take seven to $10,000. So I wouldn't want that to be like spread out amongst you know, if we add more spread out amongst more, but right now I, you know, I go back and forth on this issue. Like, do you think the cut line, the cash line is too small? Do you think it's, it's getting to the point of where it's too hard to cash or like, what are your thoughts on it? Lesser percentage of people. So you're saying the field size is too big currently. I think so. You, so you're, you're going on the take of what I've had before of where, Hey, the disc golf pro tour should take the top 15 chicks, the top 50, uh, top 50 guys, and then just go and have like a way smaller tour. I mean, that's maybe a little bit too of an extreme, but yeah, a little that's, bit more than that, what I think, but that's where you're leaning towards for sure. I think that's more of a far along the further down the path thing. But the only problem with that is, is now our pot gets smaller. That's the yeah. only thing because you know, I'm not going to name any names because I'm I'm actually down this leaderboard quite a bit as well. But there's a lot of names that finished 80th and higher that no one is showing up to watch or no one even knows who they are. So it's not like they're adding to the entertainment of the actual sport. We don't have people right now. Like there's very few courses, DMC, Maple Hill. Uh, OTB, there's a handful of courses where people show up, post up and watch every group go through. That's just not really happening the majority yeah. of the time. So these extra groups really aren't bringing anything to the table, but they are bringing money. So that's the only thing is what is it like? What do we three fifty or something? $300 to enter into these tournaments. Yeah. 350. I yeah. Think. So, so you take 20 guys out and now all of a sudden that's, that's seven that's grand. Huge. That's you're seven grand. Need some bigger so, sponsors in the game before anything like that can ever happen. That, that, I mean, that's why Worlds is such a huge payout is because they have two fields, right? They have double yeah. the field size. And so the, the purse is really coming, majority of it is really coming from just adding more people, uh, you know, gambling their money essentially, playing pl what we say, playing the local poker game. But I, I, I don't know. I go back and forth. Yuli, what are your thoughts on field size? I mean, it's a give and take. I think eventually it's going to be, I think it's just, I, I go back to like traditional golf. Like I feel like the field size should be pretty, pretty big, but at that point we better have a lot of superstars type thing. Like you, you look at traditional golf, anybody can really win any mm -hmm. at any single weekend you have your superstars but then you you see a new winner every other week it seems like and we're not seeing that yet in disc golf we are seeing new winners but they're faces that we've seen before it's it's very rare that a parker wilt comes out and you like kind of never heard of him and he wins a tournament like that was a one-off last last season but then it comes down to like your product like like brody was saying we're a product that we're an entertainment product and I feel like the more opportunities we have to develop uh, some sort of superstars, um, probably the better. Um, but that also comes from um, there, there's a second part of this that I think should happen, which is like at a developmental stage of a, like tournaments of smaller tournaments to where people can kind of earn their way on, on tour, which it looks like we're trying to trying to develop. And once we do that, then the field sizes will be, I feel like could be a little bigger, but we're also kind of grooming people to come in, earning their spots and they're already ready to play for titles type thing. We're a long ways away from that, but all in all, I think bigger field size to me seems like the more logical way to go. Do you like having cuts at tournaments, Gavin? I think so. From a player's standpoint. Yeah. If I'm even if it's a three day event? out of the cash, I don't want to go and play the fourth day. 
What right. about a three-day um, event? No, I don't think there should be cuts for three-day events. I think there should be more four-day events, though. The, the the only reason I like cuts, even, you know, I agree with you. I think four-day events are probably better um, if we could do that. But the only reason I do like cuts even at a three-day event is it gives you just an extra narrative to talk about on Saturday. Is, you know, for example, like this tournament, uh, it was pretty cut and dry going into the final round, like who was going to win. Like it was going to yeah. be either Ezra or AB. I, I threw Gannon a flyer. Um, maybe people won't believe that I did, but I did throw Gannon a flyer that he had a chance to win it before going into the final round. But I think that just gives another element of, you know, what what was the cash line? Do you guys know? 50. 50. So that would be nine, 50 got cash or 50, 50 missed cash. 50 was the cut. Okay. So the so guys, they got, they got cash. Okay. So, got cash. so these are some of the names that you could like talk about that were like right on the cash line that made it. And some that didn't make it. You've got, um, Evan Smith, Bradley Williams, Evan Scott, Nico LaCastro, Chandler Kramer, Greg Barsby, Andrew Presnell, Eric Oakley, Chandler Fry. All these guys made cash. And then you have Albert Tam, Casey White, Parker Welk, Paul Kranz, Garrett Gerthy. These guys all just miss cash. So I think it just like gives a little bit more of a narrative to some of these tournaments and maybe for people to pay attention to more than just what's going on at top is you can also be like, Oh, like this guy needs to, you know, birdie this last hole to make the cut line. Like, for sure. I don't know. It's, it's, it's something, but, uh, you, you want to finish this out? Final question. Yeah. Out of all the guys currently on tour, who, whose game do you look at? It could be putting, it could be backhand sidearm the way they carry themselves, but who do you look at and you go, and that's nice. I wish I had that. I mean, I think I'm with the 99% of disc golfers around the globe right now. It's AB. Yeah. <laughs> that's I that's mean, been the answer. It seems like we're like three I, weeks in a row. I was able to play with him. I think it was either last week. Yeah. I think it was at Austin and for how hard he can throw a disc him having the ability to like tone down on that Athena and still throw it and hit his angles with it is just so sick. What's yeah. your distance like, like compared to his? Coming off? I mean, he throws further than everyone. Um, yeah. Well, but you, you do throw incredibly far. So what, yeah, what is, what is that kind of surgery? Have you? Okay. Yeah. At least like really throwing. I used to be able to throw it over 650 feet, like every single time that I wanted to. And now it's like right at the like 550. I'm pretty comfortable. I can go out in most winds and throw the disc 550 feet. Gotcha. Maybe that's helped you a little bit, toned down a little bit. Oh, a ton. So far this year, I've went out of bounds like a tenth the amount that I did <laughs> oh, before. <nice>. <laughs> <laughs> that's the nature is keep the disc in play and don't take bogeys. Make your best for sure. Especially on a course, uh, the way that this course was set up, yeah. this, uh, a bogey was... I mean, it hurt you so much out here. Yeah. Even though somehow AB uh, had three bogeys the final round and still won. But yeah, he I guess it's like the 13 birdies or something with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to say he, he did end up, he still ended up still shooting eight under with three bogeys and then had 16 birdies the previous round and yeah, 12 birdies the previous round to that. So. Yeah, impressive sick. stuff. Um, oh, la I did want to ask this one last question before we let you go. Uh, what What does the rest of this schedule look like? Do we are we going to see you pretty much at, at all the big events? Yeah, everything. Um, European Open is still up in the air. That's the only one. I won't go over there and play the other tournaments. Okay. But European Open is the one that I'm on the fence about. Qualified for U.S. Playing Champions Cup. And all the other ones, yeah. And then uh, you want to shout out any? I know you shouted out the di collaboration you have going on. Maybe shout that out again, where people can get that, and then also uh, shout out anything else that's working with you, any sponsors, anything like that. Sweet, huge shout out to Double Eagle Disc Golf. Um, they've helped so much. They're producing my new jerseys that are coming out, 
go and pick one of those up if you want to support me. I wore them this weekend. Got a lot of compliments. People like the Eagle stuff. That was the one on Sunday, right? That was sick. And Saturday. I wore a purple one on Saturday and a green saw, one on Sunday. Yeah, I saw one where it was like, uh, oh, they, the, it's the same same uh, design, just different color? Different designs. They're oh. all different types of Eagles on there. Okay, gotcha. I think I have five colors, a white, red, green. Oh, sick. Purple. Maybe only four. Okay, nice. Oh, no, and a black one. Yeah, five. Dang. And then uh, Gateway Disc Sports. You can go and get my new Tour Series Warlocks. These things came out absolutely amazing. Shout out Dave and the crew over there. And then lastly, Destiny, my girlfriend. She's been amazing. Seriously, wouldn't even be playing this year if it wasn't for her. So That's a crazy story, man. I remember seeing that and being like, dang, Gavin's not going to play? Like, that's that sucks. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, a tough pill to swallow. That's yeah, for sure. you're, you're making it. I mean, you're like you said, you know, you kind of feel like this is a second chance and you're taking full advantage of it. And I know uh, we're all rooting for you for the rest of the season as well. I sure do appreciate that. Of course, brother. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, really thank you, take, thank you to take your time and uh, we'll see you in Jonesboro.